Hi, it's Jan Peter. And after all the Commodore stuff I did recently, I thought it would be time for a little change and I'm going to do some work on this Atari 1040 STF that Torsten kindly donated. It is in unknown condition. Uh, from the outside it looks pretty yellowed. Uh, there's sticker residue here. So definitely I'm going to try to retrobrite this and give it a good clean. And of course I'm also going to open this up and have a look at the electronics and see what I can do to refurbish them and to make this future proof. So uh, yeah, basically what I want to do is first to see if this is working at all. It is in unknown condition. Torsten didn't know um, what this was all about. Probably there's some issues with the power supply. There might be other issues. Uh, I just don't know. So let's find out. So the very first thing obviously is to uh, take this apart and have a look inside. These are pretty heavy compared to the Amiga 500. They are very much the same size. I think the Amiga is a bit longer, but uh, this is very close to the Amiga proportions. Uh, only that this has an internal power supply, which makes this a lot heavier than the Amiga. Okay, so I think I have to remove the screws around the perimeter. And these are probably for holding the drive in place, I would guess. Let's see. Okay, I think it's time for a quick word from my sponsor. This video was kindly sponsored by PCBWay. And at the moment at PCBWay there's the November and December shopping festival going on with all kinds of nifty little coupons and special deals and stuff like that. So if you are interested, I recommend checking that out. It is linked in the description. I've never worked on one of these before, so um, please excuse me, I'm an absolute Atari noob. The only thing I ever worked on from the ST series is the uh, Mega ST that I did a restoration of, and I have some plans for that too in the future still. But I haven't worked on the classic uh, ST yet. So this is the first, and I'm pretty excited about it because I, these are lovely machines. see. Okay, there we go. That wasn't too bad. <laughs> okay, there's a keyboard connector. Oh, okay. So here we are inside. Uh, the first thing that immediately uh, catches my attention is this massive amount of uh, 4256 RAM chips, uh, which is, of course, the one megabyte RAM. And uh, yeah, it's similar as on the old uh, early revisions of the Amiga 500. Half of this, uh, this is 512K, and this is another 512K. On the early Amiga 500s, you had half the amount of chips on the board and the other half in the RAM expansion, obviously. So, yeah, this is pretty interesting, actually. Uh, looks massive, but it's very cleanly laid, laid out, as the Ataris are. This is our power supply section. Uh, this has uh, some problems, usually because they are not very high quality. Uh, this is a token one. Yeah, mostly this looks better than I expected. There's no uh, massive corrosion or anything going on or any dirt, really. There's a bit of dust back here, but not, not much, nothing much to worry about, actually. So, I think I'll give this a, a closer inspection. Maybe then I just try to power this on. Okay, here's one little thing uh, concerning the case. This... Uh, this is where the screw comes through. Uh, this is like a, a standoff that belongs to the other side of the case, really, but it's broken off. So uh, we're going to have to fix that, but that's not going to be a big deal. I think I can just use some epoxy to glue that back in place. Somebody opened this can up. There's our, I guess it's the graphics uh, circuit. 
The capacitors actually all look good, so there's no bulging or anything to be seen even in the power supply capacitors, which are the ones that get the most uh, stress in these. Uh, yeah, I think I just want to remove the power supply and see if there's anything uh, suspicious under there. I have to remove the disk drive because the uh, it's screwed in through the PCB actually. Massive uh, shield here from both sides. And I love the design of the Atari drives. Just lovely. This is an early one too, I believe. Uh, I think the later ones had a little a push button on the side here, similar to the ones used in the Amigas. But these have one big push button. I really like this today. Okay, then there's two screws on the power supply board. Let's screw into the thing here. Okay. And then we should be able to take it all off, I guess. Okay. This is heavy because of the power supply there. Ha! So it turns out I can just lift this up. It was only fixed with the two screws here, I believe. <laughs> okay. So these are the ROMs, I believe. It's all very neatly laid out. I love these straightforward and clean uh, lines in the Atari design. So I love how everything is aligned in straight lines and it looks very, looks very tidy. It's very nice, tidily organized uh, PCB. Lovely. So I'm just reseating all the ICs that are in sockets, just in case. This is in the socket too. And I think I just want to, to give this a try. So, yeah, let's reattach the drive and see what it does actually. And I also connected to the keyboard on the side there, so let's see. <laughs> okay, giving me a straight 50 Hz signal, no smoke. Should take a while. Looking for a boot disk, I think. Oh, hey, there we are. Okay, so we got a working Atari ST. Picture quality looks neat. Uh, what I noticed while this was booting up is that the um, screen brightness changed slightly each time the uh, drive was accessed. So let's see if I can find some of my Atari disks and uh, try out if that is actually a problem. This is a 887 Rev D board, which probably is uh, not the earliest revision, but there are definitely more recent revisions of the Atari ST boards. Okay, found my little uh, pack of Atari ST discs that I made a while back for the Mega ST. And there's a sysinfo disk. Let's try that, I guess. But let me connect a mouse. Interestingly, the mouse and joystick connectors are on the keyboard uh, PCB. And these are slightly bent and broken. I don't know if you can see that, but the, uh, this is, I think, is pretty classical fault. But if it's the mouse, fine, it's going to work. Oh, and Torsten also uh, provided a suitable mouse, which is pretty nice. Okay, let's see if the drive works at all. This should now boot up a lot quicker in theory, at least. 
with the disc in place. If the drive works. At least it's trying to read. Yeah. And the screen flickers a tiny little bit every time the drive tries to access something. Okay, we don't have the disc, I think. Okay, maybe I just connected the mouse to the wrong port. <laughs> okay, so here's what we get. And I actually had the wrong mouse port. Um, for the Atari, the system, the TOS, is in the ROM, so you get this screen no matter whether the disk drive works or not. Let's just try to access it. Oh, the mouse needs some good cleaning. Eins, it's the German version. Floppy A antwortet nicht. Bitte überprüfen und eine Disk einlegen. Uh, floppy A is not answering. Please check and insert a disk. We have a disk inserted, so it's probably the, the disk drive is a bit... Uh, needs some love. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, okay, we have kind of a working Atari ST, which is great. But it definitely needs some love. So let's go. So the first thing I really want to do is to replace the power supply with something more reliable. And that might just fix our disk drive problem as well. Because we saw um, the screen brightness flicker when the disk drive moved the head or the, the motor moved in the disk drive. Uh, that's not a good sign. It might just be that the 12 volts or I don't think the 5 volts is uh, bad in the power supply because that's the main power line that feeds all the um, ICs and stuff. I think the 12 volts is for the motors in the disk drive. So that might be broken and might also feed the graphics circuitry. I don't know. That would be uh, some kind of explanation for the screen getting dimmer while the drive access uh, tries to access the disk. So I want to have another power supply and I think I know where I can look for one. And you have to be very careful, of course, because uh, shorting this thing out, it's basically an open uh, thing. So there's our 12 volts. Yeah, it's rock stable, actually. There's our 5. Nice. Okay, power supply seems to be fine. Uh, still get a slight screen flicker whenever the drive accesses the uh, disk or tries to access the disk. Hmm, maybe the drive is just broken. As the disk drive gives me some issues, uh, let's try and see what we can do with it. If we can maybe fix it. I think it's it probably just is. Uh, some mechanical problem. Okay, let's open up the disk drive as it's giving me some troubles. I think I'm just going to have to remove these screws. And there is some known issues with these. Um, some of the early ones have belts even, I think, that you could... Uh, it could be useful to replace those because they are just rubber belts. And uh, those don't age very well. This machine is from 1987, as we've seen on the main board, so... Uh, yeah, it's been a while. Let's see. Aha, okay, so this lifts out. There we go. Okay, there's no belt. That's a lot of capacitors, so that could give me some issues. These don't appear to be bulging or anything. Very funny that the two boards are completely different. This is a single-sided PCB, the, the brown one and the green one is the double-sided one, I believe. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. This is like the motor. There's some glue on the... on the motor there. Maybe to weight it? 
don't know why they did that. Oh, it's because, okay, that's the sensor. That's the um, hall sensor. So uh, this determines the speed. And this is the little, a little magnet, I believe, probably. Yeah, it looks like a little magnet. That's pretty crude. That's just glued on there, okay. <laughs> Didn't see something quite like that before. And it says okay. Hmm. It might not be, but let's see if we can move the top part too. There we go. Okay. This looks pretty clean. There's our read right head down there, or one of the heads. There are two heads, of course, one is on this flap and the other one is on the bottom there. That looks really clean. It seems to have been cleaned, but I'm going to clean it again, just in case. And uh, also the rail that the read right head travels on seems to have been lubricated not too long ago, but uh, yeah, I'm just going to see if, I could, if that helps anything. Just using a Q-tip and some isopropanol and just gently wiping the heads. Yeah. Okay, now I'm just cleaning off the lubricant there. There's a lot of excess. Just going to clean that off. Yeah, that's, that's a bit black. There's some residue there. Maybe I'll try to lubricate it again using my trusty silicone fat, which is like silicon grease. <laughs> and just use very small amounts of this stuff. Yeah, that moves better already. Okay. So maybe it was a, a matter of lubricating it. Here's where you want the lubricant to be on these rails. And uh, you just have to... You can slowly and carefully move the head with your hand. Um, you can just determine where parts are moving by just looking at them and lubricating them. Okay, let's try this again with the drive open, shall we? Let's see, there it moves. Inserting a disc. Basically stays down there, okay. No, no dice. Okay, motor works. Might just be a capacitor issue or something like that. Some electronic issue. Uh, meaning not the motor in this case. The stepper motor that moves the head. That seems to be alright because it moved the head. Oh, backwards there. That's, it seems to be something, it can't, just can't read stuff. So maybe the um, read right head is broken or it's misaligned. Would have to be severely misaligned if it didn't read anything at all. Let's try another disc maybe. And it's the exact same thing. So this drive is, yeah, most likely broken. Okay, let me see if I can fix this drive. Um, I'll probably end up putting a GoTech uh, disk drive emulator in there anyway, but um, I kind of I kind of wonder if uh, I can fix this anyway. So my next suspect is uh, faulty capacitors, leaky caps, because that's one of the problems that many of these drives have, uh, especially the ones that have surface mount capacitors on there. Yeah, this is not going to be easy. I think I can see how I get this board out here. Can't really see how the other one... Ah, the other one is um, screwed in from the top, I believe. Let's try this board, and I think I'm not going to bother 
if that uh, replacing the capacitors on this board doesn't fix it, I'm not going to bother uh, with this board, I think. There are a lot of capacitors on there that could be responsible for stuff not working correctly, but I believe this is the control logic on here. So this should be uh, the board that controls the stepper motor, which should be this one. Yeah, probably it's a good idea to have a look at this board first. These connectors here, you have to, um, they have like a locking mechanism, which is this part that you can just slowly and carefully pull back and then the cable should unlock. I hope. <laughs> Very carefully pull it out. There we go. Okay, the same with this one here. Ah, oh, this is a fiddly business. Now we should have enough leeway to move the whole board out, I guess. It's connected on this connector now, and the rest is loose. Uh, except for the cables, okay. This should go out like so. Okay, now we should have enough room to work on this. There's our board out! And we now have access, obviously, uh, to the little capacitors on here. <laughs> That's a nice design. That's actually soldered in from the bottom here and floating. There's holes in the PCB around there. <laughs> so they can put it in uh, upside down. Uh, probably it was easier to route some of the connections there this way around. It's still pretty interesting. So, and of course, these uh, factory fitted capacitors are ultra low profile stuff. Um, I'm just going to use some uh, regular ones that are a lot higher uh, and bend them so that they fit. We go. That's all our capacitors replaced. It doesn't look too bad, I guess, <laughs> even though they are pretty badly bent. But I think I can get away with this. Now the fun part, the reassembly. <laughs> So that's the same behavior we had before, unfortunately. Reset. The drive LED comes on and it tries to read something on startup. So I guess the um, computer itself tries to talk to the drive and tries to do something. The motor is spinning. Doesn't find a disk, doesn't see it. Okay, just tested this with a GoTech drive, which is a disk drive emulator uh, I am going to talk about in another video. But uh, just to make sure this works, I tried it with the GoTech, and yeah, as you can see, it's, it works absolutely no problem. Uh, so the main board itself is all right, it's the disk drive that has issues. Hmm, so I think I want to give up on the disk drive. For now, I'm just going to fit a GoTech anyway at a later point. Uh, let me work on future-proofing the mainboard. So I got a lot of actual capacitors, which are these ones where the leads come out on either end of the little barrel. <laughs> and uh, yeah, these are Vishai brand. I believe this is a good brand and these are uh, pretty easy to obtain compared to other actual caps. Uh, there are a lot of no-name brands. I got these from Konrad Elektronik in Germany. Um, 
can't say anything on where they are available, but they are available from uh, known electronics sellers. So, yeah, we need a lot of actual caps for this thing. There's only, I think, one uh, radial cap on this whole board, and the other ones are actual because it's uh, such a flat design. So, yeah, let's get right into it and recap this Atari ST board now that we know that it's working. Oh, and I'm not going to bother uh, recapping the power supply because these are known to fail quite frequently anyway. And I have other plans for replacing this thing, but I want to replace the capacitors on the board for good measure. Okay, so these plastic uh, standoffs for the disk drive, I think they are the plastic is just um, pushed through the holes there and then melted on the other side. Uh, yeah, just broke this one off because I was not careful enough. And I thought they were just uh, stuck in there, like a pressure fit or something. But they are, I think they are like plastic welded to the PCB. Yeah, it's difficult to tell if they are actually, uh, maybe they are just glued or maybe they are just brittle and old and it uh, seems like they are welded. So as usual, I'm going to do this one by one, so I don't get values confused. I'm going to take good care of where the positive and where the negative leads go. It is marked on this board, uh, as far as I can see it is marked correctly. There are boards where the silk screen on the PCB is off. Uh, and there are also boards, especially from Commodore, where the capacitors are fitted from factory, the wrong polarity. But uh, we don't want to do that in this case, uh, so I'm going to take good care of which direction they face. I'm going to use the same capacitance and the same voltages or slightly higher voltages, which isn't much of a problem. If you go too high in the voltages, the um, characteristics of the capacitor are going to change, but uh, usually you are going to be fine with whatever voltage, as long as you don't go like 10 times the voltage or something like that. Uh, yeah, let's just go and go into a recapping montage. Okay, here's something a bit special. Uh, in this position here, C29, there is a 4.7 microfarad uh, capacitor, 35 volts, that says NP, and NP means non-polarized, so we need a bipolar or non-polarized capacitor. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an actual one, so I am going to use a radial one and bend the legs so that we can use that. I have some 4.7 microfarad radial bipolar caps. I uh, don't know if it's easy to find those in the actual variety. I don't think so. So I'm just going to make one, like so. Just bend one leg over. The other one goes straight to the board. Polarity doesn't matter, obviously. <laughs> Let's do this. Okay, in 
into the treasure chest. And there's two R capacitors as well. I think there's another bipolar. <laughs> 4.7 microphone. Okay. So we're going to do the same as before, probably. literally forgot the elephant in the room, which is this large 4700 microfarad one. Okay, time for a smoke test! Okay, fingers crossed this still works! Wide screen. It's not the worst sign. <laughs> okay, there we are. It seems to still work, at least. So the next step will be to take care of the power supply, which isn't really reliable, and I have a replacement for that. Let me show you. So here's the old power supply, uh, and it has four, five, six connections going out to this uh, plug that plugs into the main board and it says main power supply point. So all we gotta do is to provide five volts and 12 volts and ground to this plug here. And uh, because this is a pretty early switching power supply, it's a it's, it's a reasonably good one, but it's pretty old, and there are better power supplies nowadays. Uh, these are pretty prone to failure, from what I've heard about the Ataris. Uh, so I'm just going to get rid of this, probably put it on eBay or something, for somebody to uh, restore a machine to uh, their original state. I am going to use a more re reliable, or at least I think it's more reliable than this one, power supply that I just bought for this purpose, and it should fit perfectly. Let's have a look. And if you are following my channel here, you have seen me use these before. It's a Meanwell RD50A, uh, which is an industrial grade power supply unit uh, that has outputs 5 volts and 12 volts. So and this is the Meanwell RD50A, link is going to be in the description. And uh, yeah, this is 6 amps on the plus 5 volt, which is plenty, and 2 amps on the plus 12 rail. And it should also fit physically. These are pretty good, uh, the capacitors in there are Rubicon, I believe, and I don't know, Panasonic, I don't, I can't really see it, but they, they use, um, they use good brand parts in these. It has these screw terminals, which are pretty reliable, and uh, I used the exact same one, not this one, but the same model in my uh, Mega ST. If you want to watch that video, you can do so in the corner there. And, uh, yeah. It worked pretty well, so I'm just going to see if I can fit it in my ST. So the old one is uh, fastened with screws on this thing here, uh, which we can just unscrew it and screw this one on there. Probably have to put some holes in there, but maybe we can even use the old cables. Probably, maybe they, they reach around here. We're, we're going to see about that. Let's mount this on the uh, little bracket 
that the old one is on. Okay, first off, let's remove this old one. There we go. I think I just want to cut the wires. And as I said repeatedly, be very careful with the uh, big capacitors on these, because they store, in this case, 400 volts. Only for a short period of time, but the, they are going to um, put 400 volts across your body if you touch the terminals here. So, uh, careful with these switching power supplies. So, and as I see it, we can just untangle this cable tie here. Nice. Or we can just... I think we can just pull them through. Yeah, we can. Okay. So now we have... This is our mains connection here. Nice. We probably want to connect another grounding point there, although the ground is also connected through the case on these. Okay, so I think I want to, I want to fit it like this if it fits on the board, because that makes more sense. Then we have to um, make these cables from the mains a bit longer. Hmm. So I think in order to make this fit, we have to dremel out uh, this corner from the uh, metal casing of the meanwhile power supply. But that's so that the connector fits easily. We could mount it yeah, but it's. I think it's just reasonable. The most reasonable thing to do would be to cut this uh, corner out of the casing here. Could probably get away with just bending it upwards or something. Just make a cut here and here and bend this and this the same. Bend it inwards. So we want this corner here to go away. So we could just cut this out, I guess with a Dremel, which isn't a Dremel, but a Proxon thing. Proxon? Proxon? Not sure how they are pronounced. So a bit of work with the file and the Dremel or the Proxon uh, rotary tool. And here we are. I just cut it out uh, so that it matches the cutout that is in the PCB. Doesn't look too bad. And this should fit pretty nicely. I want to quickly test if this fits with the um, keyboard and in the case. Ah, no it doesn't. We have to cut another corner here. This corner here is in the way too, so we... Yeah, we can, maybe we can just bend this whole thing out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that should do it, I guess. Yay, and the keyboard fits! Let's see if we can uh, close the lid on it. This should work. So here's how I want this to sit. Uh, like so, basically. And then we have our the connection to the main board right here, which will make uh, these cables a lot shorter. And we have, these have to go, yeah, we're probably going to drive around here or something. That will make sense. And the thing is we have 
two screw holes on the bottom here. We want to have the two screw holes in here, so there's more power tools involved. <laughs> Okay, Jan using power tools again. Hey, and the holes line up too. <laughs> That's a bonus. Okay, nice. Okay, now I am going to clip this connector off here and try to connect it directly to the right outputs on the power supply. And I'm going to desolder these two wires that come from the power switch because that's uh, the mains power after the switch is what we want to uh, power this thing and uh, connect them to the live and neutral and uh, white and black are the color codes for the US and Canada I believe uh, here we have blue and brown for neutral, neutral and live uh, so I'm going to do with uh, these colors so it's uh, easier to understand for me because I am going to be or probably going to be the only person um, inside this thing or somebody in Germany probably. Um, yellow green is the earth or um, ground. I'm going to connect that to one of the screw terminals on the case here because the mains ground is connected to the case and I'm just going to go and connect it somewhere here with my own connection. I think I'm going to go with crimp connectors like these um, spade connectors for uh, pushing these into the terminals and I'm going to go with like a ring connector for um, connecting the ground wire. I don't know if these are uh, the diameter is large enough for my little crimping things here. Maybe, we'll see about that. Uh, but otherwise I'm just going to stick them into the terminals and screw them. These are made for um, taking uh, wires as well as these spade connectors, so it's not going to be a problem if I connect the wire directly there. These spade connectors just make it um, less probable that um, like a strand of wire gets, gets loose and uh, falls into the PCB. But yeah, it doesn't matter much really, it's just a more elegant way. <laughs> so let's see what we can do here. Oh, and of course I wrote down the, the colors of these wires, so I get the... Uh, I connect the right wires to the right uh, terminals there. Let's go! Um, I'm just using the screws from the original power supply because they fit the new power supply nicely in these... Uh, here. Yeah, so let me desolder these two wires. So this is the correct orientation. I just checked with the case. This is on where the dot is, is on. And it's facing towards the uh, power jack here. So there should be some sort of insulation on the back of the power supply. I think I'm just going to put some electrical tape around here at least to isolate the live wires here. So 
So that's our mains collection scrimmed. Let's screw this together! Okay, so let's put a ground wire, I think, on this terminal here, maybe. That would make sense. So it seems like this is going to fit beautifully. Uh, the terminal labeled plus V is the plus 12 and we have plus 5 for the red ones. The blue one has to go to the plus V. The black ones I'm just going to connect to the COM terminal because I think they are the COM terminals are connected together anyway. So these are definitely uh, connected together. Roger, twang, tranquility. We got you on the ground. We got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Oh, hey, it looks like we have a connection there. Neat. <laughs> <laughs> Works like a charm. Ah. Okay. I think I want to measure the 5 volts uh, before I power this thing up because that's adjustable. But it should be adjusted for 5 volts, I guess. Uh, yeah. I want to check this out of the circuit. Even though this is in. Uh, this can't really be used without a load because it's going into recovery mode. Uh, and like pumping the voltage on and off but uh, yeah we're going to have a measurement of the 5 volts anyway okay let's test this briefly uh, don't want to turn this on for too long because as I said can't really be done without a load let's turn this on Okay, it's whining. That's our 5 volts. It's a bit low, but that's okay. That's our 12 volts. Okay, so this is completely working. Turn it off. Stopped whining. Okay, let's put it into the Atari and see if it actually powers the Atari. Making good contact. Okay. <laughs> this never gets old. I'm still very, very nervous. But uh, I measured the voltages. They are all right. This should just power on fine, if I'm not mistaken. So let's uh, test it. Fingers crossed this actually works. Hey, and we have a picture, so that means the Atari still works. And in fact, it looks better than before. We don't have any... Uh, there was some distortion and some noise going on in the uh, video output with the old power supply. So it was definitely a good idea to replace that. There's, it's absolutely crystal clear now. I don't know how well it translates on camera, but uh, yeah, the picture quality is just awesome, actually. I actually 
tried to fit uh, the power supply with the RF shield that I have uh, lying around from another ST that we're going to see on this channel at some point. And uh, it doesn't fit while you have the RF uh, shield in the case. Uh, so, yeah. Um, otherwise, it's, it's pretty much a drop-in replacement for the old power supplies. This is the one from the ST, from the other ST uh, that I have. So, you can use these uh, replacement power supplies for a variety of <coughs> Atari ST models that have the, the same pinout. <coughs> I think they all have the same pinout and the same uh, amperage requirements, pretty much. So, the mean well should be suitable for all of these machines. Okay, so this definitely was a successful refurb of the electronics in our Atari ST. Uh, next time we are going to be concerned with uh, the case, I think, because that's in pretty sorry state. Uh, yeah, but that's enough for this video, I guess. So, thank you very much for watching, hope you enjoyed this, hope you found it informative, and I hope that some Atari STs can be brought back to an even longer life <laughs> with uh, the help of some of the uh, things I tried in this video. So yeah, I'm Jan Beta, thanks for watching, see you next time, bye!